Welcome back. Our lecture today is an overview of how women's roles and society's perspective of them were affected by the changing economy of the first half of the 1800s. The image on the screen is from Lowell Mills in the 1840s. This mill produced textiles, which refers to cloth. Textile production was the first major industrial product in the U.S. In the picture, we see that most people are women. This points to a little recognized fact that women participated as industrial workers from the very beginning. In our lecture, we'll connect changes in the economy to changes in gender identity of both men and women, but with a focus on women. To do this, we'll cover three main topics, economic influence on social structure, textile manufacturing, and development of class identity. So let's get started. At the beginning of the semester, in a lecture on pre-Columbian societies, I argued that the environment has a big influence on social structure, the rules and attitudes of how communities interact with each other. We will see the same effect in the 1800s. To begin, we should recognize that the market economy was expanding and pulling more people into it. But what is the market economy? Let's look at three main aspects. One, it is an economy that does not have any fixed price for goods. The price for a product is entirely dependent on whether there are people willing to buy it. When a product rises in demand, the price increases. When demand drops, the price decreases. Two, a market economy tends to push producers, those that make products, towards specialization. This means that a producer will focus on making a single product the benefit is that they will tend to make the product more efficiently and with better quality, thus giving them an advantage in selling their product on the market. The negative thing about specialization is that it tends to make a producer more vulnerable to fluctuation in demand. The third aspect is that a market economy increases the use of money. When we discuss Puritan societies, it was pointed out that they feared money. Instead, their economy was a barter economy, where people exchanged goods and services. A barter economy works best in societies where people know and trust each other. By contrast, a market economy is impersonal. Money does the talking. It is important to remember that money is simply a representation of value. Money has many positive features. It is easy to exchange. It is easy to carry. It is easy to divide into small transactions or compound into large ones. All these things make it important in a market economy. Let's now look at how and why the market economy expanded and how it changed social structure. This picture depicts an artisan workshop. An artisan is a person who produces usable goods like pottery, hats, shoes, cabinets, tin products, things like that. During the 1700s, most finished products were made by artisans. This began to change in the early 1800s as the U.S. population increased. In 1780, the U.S. population was about 3 million people. This would not include Indians. It increased to about 5 million in 1800, to almost 15 million, one five million in 1830, and about 30 million in 1860. So in 80 years, the U.S. grew by about 1,000%. This means that it was 10 times as big as before. This extremely fast population growth led to many economic and social changes. Manufacturing had to change in order to meet consumption demands that appeared with population growth. In turn, artisans began to change how they produced goods. Before 1800, Products were made to order. A customer said they wanted a product, and it was made to their specifications. Before 1800, artisans all belonged to guilds. A guild is an association. For example, there would be a guild for hat makers, cabinet makers, etc. Guilds controlled how much was produced as well as pricing. The goal was to avoid competition and overproduction. But guilds did not make sense in an environment of extremely high demand 
created by rapid population growth. At the beginning of the 1800s, we see a movement away from guilds and the artisan workshop. The movement to early manufacturing used the same artisan shops but produced things differently. Instead of waiting for orders to be placed, the shops produced goods in anticipation of consumers. Products were not custom made, but instead made in categories. For example, think of shoes, pants, shirts in a series of sizes. To expand production, the putting out system was developed. Shops that produce goods like shoes, hats, and coats would cut pieces at the shop and put it out into people's homes, normally small farmers nearby where they would be put together and returned as finished products to the shop. Small farmers earned money and shops expanded production. Changing the way merchandise was produced began an important social transformation. The artisan workshop functioned almost like a family. Everyone worked and lived in the same building. The master craftsman was a father figure, and even though his workers, such as journeymen and apprentices, were not his children, they accepted the authority of the master. The master was responsible for everybody's well-being. But as the putting out system developed, the social relations in the shop changed. There was less craft needed in the shop, the guild system was no longer needed, and people began to see each other more like employers and employees, where exchange was based on money as in wages. Change also occurred on the small farms where products were increasingly put together. In most cases, it was women who put the products together. This was an extension of other duties they had in the home. But a key point here is that they were doing work for wages. So we see that the market economy was beginning to pull women into the income-earning workforce. This process was going to intensify as manufacturing also was intensifying. So let's now turn to the first major industry in the U.S., textile manufacturing. As noted earlier, textile refers to cloth. The first large-scale production of non-farm goods was in textiles. Incidentally, the growth of this industry is directly linked to cotton production in the South. We'll discuss this in our next lecture. At this point, we can just say that the expansion of slave plantations Producing cotton is directly tied to the expansion of textile industries. Low mills were the first full-scale industrial center in the U.S. These mills were in Massachusetts and modeled after textile mills in England. The mills were constructed in 1821. Their construction corresponds with a spike in population growth. Demand for cloth had outpaced artisans' abilities to meet the demand. The mills at Lowell used new machines that combined spinning and weaving to produce cloth in mass. Spinning machines took cotton and made yarn. Weaving machines took yarn and produced cloth. At these mills, the vast majority of workers were women. The reason for this is that spinning and weaving had been practiced by women in their homes for centuries. In turn, they were familiar with the product and were seen as a natural group of workers. In addition, population growth had increased land prices in the Northeast. Young women saw opportunities to earn money that would allow their families to acquire land. Still, families were reluctant to allow their unwed daughters to move to Lowell. So the mills offered something beyond money. They offered education and a wholesome environment. The owners of low mills promised families that their daughters would be looked after, but an unforeseen social change was begun. Low provided housing for young women working at the mills. They also assigned older, unmarried women to live in the dormitories to watch over younger women's morals. In addition to housing, all women were required to attend church and school. School focused on literature, and produce a newspaper as part of their education. In the images on the screen, we get a sense of how regimented the process was. We see a list of bells that told people when to move from one activity to another. 
In this picture, we see the types of machines women would work. We also see that young women were working. A sense of womanhood began to develop because men were absent from most of the activities. And for the first time, we have large numbers of women of varying ages in isolation from men, living, working, and socializing together. A sense of womanhood was in evidence during a recession of the mid-1830s. Because there was a downturn in the market, prices for textiles fell. To try and maintain profits, managers at Lowell Mills lowered wages and decreased educational opportunities. In response, women at Lowell organized work stoppages to demand a return of their benefits. So in addition to women being the first industrial workers, we see they began to take actions that look very much like unions. The mills responded by recruiting immigrant women from Ireland to undercut American workers. On the whole, low mills moved away from recruiting workers from American farms and focused instead on immigrant workers. The economic experiment low is an example of how changes in the economy led to changes in social practices. Low mills made important technological discoveries that had an impact on industries that developed in the mid and late 1800s. But they also pointed out that workers could develop a sense of empowerment. To combat workers' potential power, Lowell recruited desperate workers from Ireland. This was a lesson that other industries would also follow. To control workers, industries would recruit desperate people who would be less likely to demand much from employers. As we move through the 1800s, we will see a polarization of wealth. This means that wealth is moving in opposite directions at the same time. We see an increase in wealth in the hands of some, and we see increased poverty for many others. In addition, we also see the growth of a middle section in the economy. These economic changes also had an impact on the images of women. These images point to two extreme identities appearing as wealth expanded and polarized. In this image, we see a woman as an object of wealth. This is a woman who is unlikely to have a productive role. This is evidenced by her clothing. This type of clothing forced a woman to physically alter her body quite often in a permanent manner. The corset is the key to this. For a woman to wear this dress and put on the corset, she may have needed an operation to remove her lower ribs. Quite often, women wearing this type of clothing suffered permanent tissue damage. This picture illustrates another extreme for women. This is a print from a magazine of the 1850s. It is telling poor women that they have to accept their place in society no matter how difficult it may be. The caption at the bottom says, Get thee behind me, Mrs. Satan. I would rather travel the hardest path of matrimony than follow in your footsteps. Mrs. Satan is the woman in the forefront. We can see aspects of the devil in her wings, her hair that is fashioned like horns, and a cleft hoof appearing from her dress. The sign Mrs. Satan holds says, Be saved by free love. This was a slogan used by women's rights activists who wanted women to be able to divorce abusive husbands. The magazine that produced this image was saying that women's rights leaders of the 1800s were representatives of the devil. The competing images of women were directly related to class lines that were being intensified. Earnings are a key to understanding class lines, but dollars in themselves were not the defining line. People did not ask, how much do you make, and thus place a person into a class. Instead, the amount of money earned pushed people to take actions that define class lines. To understand this, let us look at an example. In the 1840s in New York City, a family of four needed $600 per year for their basic necessities such as food, housing, and clothing. A male industrial worker at that time earned about $240 a year. This meant that he could not sustain a family on his own. 
so his wife would also work, but she would only earn about $160 per year. This is still not enough to support a family, so children also were put to work. Each additional child was a wage earner, so there was pressure for working class families to have big families. In practice, this is similar to what happened on farms. The key difference is that this was occurring in the growing urban centers and the work was for wages. But in addition, these social practices were defining the class that a person fit into. What we see in the example just provided is how earnings push people at the lower economic levels to have men, women, and children work and have generally large families. Social status was measured by these family practices, not by the dollar amount. Large families, where all members worked, were seen as lower class. More importantly, a man who had to have his wife work was judged negatively. Society saw them as men who did not work hard and also were unintelligent. Similarly, women who worked were seen in suspicious terms. In this environment of intensifying class identity, we see the molding of a middle class concept. A definition of middle class was molded in the first half of the century and remains in many ways to our present time. Middle class identity would be measured by family size, gender roles, and a new sense of childhood. These aspects of identity were also related to earnings. If a man could earn $600 a year on his own, he was able to maintain the family on his own individual income. People who were professionals, such as accountants, lawyers, managers, and supervisors of industries, most often fit into this category. But quite often, these individuals earn just above $600 a year. So if they wanted to support a family on their own, they needed to keep their family small. Each additional child made it more difficult to support the family. The outcome is that the definition of being middle class became associated with small family size. A second aspect was that children did not work. Instead, a child's role was to focus on education that would allow them to continue middle class standing. For a boy, this meant school with an aim on joining the professions. For a girl, it meant learning domestic duties that would make her a good wife. Gender ideals were clearly defined for the middle class. Men function in the world outside the home. Women's place was inside the home. Women were also primary educators of the children. They supported boys' formal education, and so middle class women had to achieve a level of literacy themselves. Women were also the moral compasses for the family. These roles for women do not seem very different than in Puritan communities. The big difference is that the growing economy began to separate society into class. And earnings pushed people to take actions that would in turn define the class that a family fit into. These issues regarding class are going to be things that are going to continue into the next century. But for now, let's end our lecture here. See you in class.